a national championship rematch and the nation's number one offense versus number one defense in the same region on Thursday night. The East region is about to blow your mind. You are locked on college basketball, part of the locked on podcast network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there. We're your hosts. This is the man, Andy Patton. I'm Isaac Shade, and you're joining us at The Place to get your college basketball content every single day. Thanks for making us your first listen or watch. By the way, you can listen to this ad free on Amazon Music. Great stuff that they do over there. We're really grateful for their partnership. Special shout out to all you everydayers joining us. We're glad you're here. Here, coming up on the show today, it's Wednesday, but we're going to go ahead and start getting you ready for Thursday night so that on Thursday we can get you ready for Friday night, Andy, because then it's games. We got to react to games the rest of the week. So here's how this is going to go today. We'll do an East region preview, then we'll do a West region preview, and then at the end of the show, we're going to talk about uh, an interesting coaching rumor at the at the home that Papa John's built, Andy, and then we'll have a couple portal updates um, and and uh, I guess a couple NBA declaration type things as well. But Andy, let's start in the East Regional, which will be played in Boston on Thursday night. This is the upper left quadrant of the bracket. Andy, tipping off, let me give us both of these. We'll take them in chronological order. Starting off will be a national championship rematch. Number one, UConn versus number five, San Diego State, 739 Eastern. Uh, UConn favored at our friends at FanDuel by 10 and a half points. Andy, I actually forgot to put what uh, TV station that one's on. I'm guessing CBS, but we'll look it up here. And while you start talking, I'll look it up, or maybe you're looking it up while I'm talking. This The game that will follow this one 30 minutes after is number two, Iowa State versus number three, Illinois. Iowa State, the number one defense at Ken Palm. Illinois, the number one offense at Ken Palm. This is insane. So that game should tip around 10.09 Eastern Get your naps in now, people. Cyclones favored by a point and a half. Andy, you got the TV stations for us? TBS for both of them. T or C? T, TBS. Turner, Ted Turner coming through on these games. All right, Andy, let's start with the national championship rematch. Is it going to be a repeat of the rematch? It, it, I think so. I, I ultimately think so. And I, and I think I talked about this uh, on Wednesday's episode, of, or excuse me, on Tuesday's episode, that this is the fourth time this has ever happened, where two teams are rematching who played each other in the national championship the previous year. And in all three previous instances, one of those teams ended up winning the national championship. In two of those three instances, it was the team repeating as national champions. Florida played UCLA in a rematch of the 2006 national championship in 2007. Of course, Florida then went on ahead and won. In 1991, we had Duke play UNLV. UNLV had won in 1990. Duke went ahead and won in 1991. And then way back in 1962, Cincinnati and Ohio State Played each other, Cincinnati coming off a national championship. They went ahead and won it again in 1961. So while repeat national champions are exceedingly rare in college basketball history, so too is playing the same team that you played in the previous championship in the tournament. Not saying it's an omen, not saying it's a sign, but it's certainly notable that UConn, a team that is probably getting as much attraction as we've seen as a potential repeat national champion that I can remember in the last couple of years. So certainly uh, some more juice for them to potentially do it. They got to get by a very good San Diego state team. They got to get by Jaden Ledee, who has been absolutely fantastic for Brian Dutcher's team. I think the matchup of Donovan Klingon versus Jaden Ledee is going to be a crucial, crucial factor in this game. Uh, posts have not done very well against Donovan Klingon. And there are a lot of really, really good post players in the Big East. It's not like Klingon has just been has been able to have this kind of Reason. defensive impact yeah. against lower tier opponents. I mean, he's been doing it against guys like Ryan Kalkbrenner and Joel Soriano and Oso Iguodaro, and the list goes on and on and on. Tons of great bigs in the Big East. And obviously, UConn played a very rigorous non-conference schedule as well. So when Klingon's healthy, he can neutralize just about anybody. But Ladie loves that little mid-post jump shot. He, he's not just a, a, a truly back to the basket, can't do anything else type of, of offensive player. So if he can potentially pull Klingon away from the rim, uh, Donovan's not bad away from the rim. It's not he's, He doesn't have as many limitations defensively as some of the other great bigs uh, this year and in years past. But certainly if you're San Diego State, anything you can do 
that prevents Donovan Glingen from just being right around the basket is good news because that could create more driving lanes for Lamont Butler, for Darion Trammell, for any of their other guards to potentially try to, to make some noise that way. But ultimately, UConn is the better team. They are, are so well-rounded offensively. I have a hard time, even with a very, very good defense that is San Diego State, a disciplined defense, a well-coached unit, I, I just have a hard time seeing them being able to slow UConn down enough with the various offensive weapons that they have. I th I'm taking UConn here. I think they advance. I think San Diego State will put up a solid fight, but UConn is, is, is overwhelmingly good, and I think that'll show up in this contest. Yeah, and I think like even as you start diving in like matchup by matchup, you know, like Jaden Ladee is a big man at six nine, but right. seven two is five inches taller than six yep. nine. You know, you you think about like, oh man, Darion Tramiel finally had a you know a pretty nice game yeah, against Yale, <laughs> dropping in eighteen five of eight um, from the field there in that one, four of seven from three. But you look at it and you're like, yeah, but he's got to go up against the first team All-American point guard yeah. by the name of Tristan Newton, you know, who was the leading scorer in this game last year when they played in the national Ch And so just going on down through the line, as you said, like Micah Parrish and Reese Dixon Waters, like the thing is for San Diego State, outside of Jaden Ledee, literally no one else is averaging double digits this season, Andy, from a scoring standpoint. He's right. got 21-something. And then you've got, you know, three guys pretty, pretty even there. Um let me get back to the point. Uh, Reese Dixon Waters, 9.8. Butler, 9.4. And Micah Parrish, 9.3. Yeah. But it's like, you look at what UConn's doing, and it's like, it could be anybody's night. It could be a Tristan Newton night. It could be a Cam Spencer night. It could yeah. be a Caravan night. It could be a Klingon night. Like, it's, it's just too much firepower for the reigning national champions. And I'm with you. I think UConn ultimately wins this game. Ten and a half is a little bit potentially big, yeah. but... I mean, it's what they've been doing. They've won, is it now eight straight uh, NCAA tournament games by double digits? Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. It would be. And I think I saw that this might even set a record if they do a double digit victory here again. So, Andy, let's turn our attention to the fourth game of the evening. UConn San Diego State is the second tip of the evening, but the first tip in Boston, obviously. Illinois and Iowa State for you East Coasters, legitimately, I'm sorry, you need to take a nap. Yeah. I've complained on Twitter before about how late the national championship game starts. This is even worse. Yeah. So, um, Andy, and that's a bummer because for me, this is my absolute favorite game of the Sweet 16 and it starts after 10 o'clock Eastern time, assuming that UConn San Diego State doesn't run long, right? Like that's like the earliest it's going to start. Yeah. And so just like that's a thing right out of the gate that we're going to have to deal with. Um, Andy, the, the storyline here, as I mentioned earlier, is number one defense versus number one offense, where I think the the flip then the question is, you know, both of those are going to be strong. And that so that'll be an interesting matchup on Illinois' offensive side of the floor. They've made huge strides. Um, using Damask in some different ways now, that Batman Robin nature. Uh, but, you know, we've been kind of joking that it's Batman and Batman nature because mm -hmm. of what he and Terrence Shannon are both able to do. But the question then is, how does that work against Iowa State's defense? Are they able to shut those guys down? Do somebody else for Illinois have to step up and, and take care of things offensively? But Andy, in some ways, with those two units being the storyline, I wonder if at some level, it's the other side of the floor that we're maybe not paying enough attention to. What happens when Iowa State, who's been shooting much better lately, like their three-point production has really, really grown. What happens on that side of the floor when they're going up against an Illinois defense that's rated number 92 at Ken Palm? Yeah, I think that's the, the critical matchup here is how can Iowa State uh, shoot the basketball? Can they avoid turning the basketball over? They've been pretty good at that throughout the season uh, on the year, averaging about 16 assists, about 11 turnovers per game. Uh, the three-point shooting has been a bit inconsistent for them throughout the year, but when they are shooting well, they are a really, really tough team to defend. And I think Illinois, that's not an area that they succeed. They're not particularly good defensively. Uh, and I think that for Illinois, there, this is a, a somewhat inconsistent offensive team, but I think all they have to do is be good enough offensively to to mitigate what they're able to do defensively. And again, uh, you're asking Iowa State, who has the best defense in the country, to defend the best offense in the country. It's going to be a difficult task to slow down Shannon, to, to slow down Damask, to slow down Coleman Hawkins on the block. But 
I think for Iowa State, they're going to play a possession style game. They're going to prevent Illinois from getting up into the 80s, the 90s offensively uh, in terms of point total. And I think that's going to be enough for Iowa State to because I think they're going to score better than they have throughout the season. I think we're going to see big games from Gilbert and Lipsy. Those guys yeah, are, that's a good word. are Gilbert's a little under 35 percent from three. But if he can shoot well in this game, if Lipsy can shoot well, I, I just think that those two guys are, are going to be really tough for Illinois to defend. And I think Iowa State has enough depth. They have enough talent uh, throughout the rest of their roster. And, and again, if they can dictate the pace, if they can control, you know, the tempo and kind of make have an efficient offensive night against a defense that allows you to do that typically, I see Iowa State advancing in this game. I think their defense is better than Illinois' offense, and I think that that's going to show through in, in a win for the Cyclones. And Andy, this game has one of my favorite freshmen in the entire country, Milan Momchilovic for Iowa State. He's a lot of fun to watch. His three-point shooting in particular has been on point lately. So uh, don't miss out on him in this game. Well, we're kind of talking already about teams that have uh, questionable defenses with very good offenses, and that's going to be a big storyline in the West region. Can Alabama, can they score enough points to take down an excellent North Carolina team? Because they're going to struggle to defend them as they have throughout the season. We're going to break down that matchup in just a second. But first, today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by Better Together. Folks, are you tired of the same daily fantasy grind where you make a roster, cross your fingers, and hope for the best, or losing on the last leg of your pick'em entry? Introducing Better Together, the first cooperative daily fantasy platform where team teamwork triumphs talent and you can play with your friends, not against them. Pick more or less on any real-time player stats, strategize with your partner to boost your odds, and climb the leaderboard together. So grab a friend and join the social DFS movement. Better Together also gives inexperienced players an immersive way to learn about DFS. Teaming up with and following the lead of experienced friends and teammates in a team contest can take away the fear of diving in for the first time. So Locked On College Basketball fans, you need to show that you're the best players by participating in the Fan Challenge Series for a chance to win real money prizes. You can see the app for contest details. So download Better Together now from the App Store and sign up using promo code Locked On for a chance to win your share of over $1,000 in cash prizes. Remember the code Locked On because winning alone is fun, but it is better together. Andy, this episode is also brought to you by Amazon Fire TV, which is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug right on into your existing TV to provide access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's March Madness or the opening weekend of MLB, Andy, it's coming up. Yeah. Chop on. Let's go, Braves. You're going to want to have a Fire Fire TV. I have Amazon Fire Sticks on literally every TV in my house. I love the layout. I love the user experience. Super easy. And the remote is handy and even has these little buttons that take you directly to Disney Plus or Netflix or whatever you need. Fire TV also recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free, including all of us at Locked On. Not to mention they've got great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking videos as well. So check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't done so, you should trust us on this. To learn more, visit amazontv.com slash locked on fire TV. We turn our attention from the East Coast to the West. La La Land, Andy, the West region in Los Angeles. The first game of Thursday night is Arizona, the number two seed against Clemson, the six seed, 709. This is on CBS, Arizona favored by seven and a half. Andy, we get to the nightcap in the West region, and that's the game we're actually going to talk about first, which is number one seed North Carolina against the four seed Alabama, approximately 939 Eastern on CBS as well. North Carolina favored by three and a half. Andy, we were just talking about the number one offense versus number one defense that we had in Iowa State and Illinois. Here's what's interesting about this game. We've got three of the four units that are all rated in the top 16 of efficiency at Ken Palm. North Carolina's offense, North Carolina's defense, and Alabama's phenomenally elite offense. The problem, Andy, hmm. is that the Alabama defense was the lowest rated defense at Ken Palm in this entire 68-team field of team, like the only teams that were worse 
were seeded 12 through 15. So the worst defense of all the power six schools in this field. What, what, like, is there anything they can do to slow down RJ Davis, Armando Baycott and company? I mean, short of completely changing the defensive style they've played all year in a matter of days. No, I don't think so. And I think it's going to be a problem. Now, North Carolina has had offensive inconsistencies and it is not insane to imagine that even against a, a not very good defense that Carolina could struggle and Carolina even again even against a bad defense Carolina is going to need to put up their points because Alabama That's is right. going to get a bunch of them That's right. and, and Carolina is a very good defensive team the adjustments that Hubert Davis has made this season uh, in terms of how they run their defense and kind of playing a defensive style that more fits the personnel on the roster have been phenomenal. And I think he deserves a lot of credit for making some of those adjustments. And I think that will work well against Alabama. But again, even a good defensive game against Alabama, they're probably going to get 80. You know, they're probably going to get up into that range. So if you're Carolina, you need to expect that you got to score 85, 88, 90 to win this game. Now, that might not be that difficult to do against, against Alabama's defense. Against Alabama, that's right. And I think it's going to start in the front court. I, R.J. Davis is the best player in this game, hands in down. In the back court, you mean? So, no, I mean in the front court. Oh, Even I'm sorry. I think R.J. Davis <laughs> is the best player in this game, and him and Mark Sears is an incredible battle. Uh, how Alabama defends – Armando Baycott. That's the storyline. I'm tracking with you. Even I apologize for my <laughs> terrible interruption, which was misguided. <laughs> no, you got me. We've mixed up front court and back court before. So, <laughs> um, but no, I, I, Baycott is, he's so big. He's, he's playing really good right now. Uh, he's you know, a fifth year guy. He's been there for a long time. He's been in this tournament. He knows what to do. And I just don't see obvious solutions on Alabama's roster to defend him. Grant Nelson is not going to go toe to toe with nothing. Armando Baycott and right. succeed. I mean, he's just not going to. I think Grant Nelson is a fine player, uh, and I think you know he has some decent shot blocking numbers on the year, one and a half per game. But he's not going to slow down Baycott one on one. Neither is Nick Pringle. I just don't see them being able to do that. If you swarm Baycott on the double teams, maybe you can c cause a few turnovers that way. But then you're potentially leaving somebody like Davis or somebody like Cormac Ryan, or potentially a, a cutting Harrison Ingram. Like you're leaving those guys open in ways that uh, is going to present problems for Alabama. So to me, you nailed it. There's three of the top 16 offense defensive metrics at Ken Palmer in this game, but Alabama's defense is so significantly below. It is hard to imagine, even though their offense is great, and even though Carolina's defense, which is good, is you know has had their inconsistencies, I, it's hard for me to see Alabama being able to overcome that unless RJ Davis has like an incredibly like one for 20 type of game, which he's probably not going to do. <laughs> that would be a thing. Yeah. My goodness. Andy, I think you hit it square on the head. What's interesting to me is that Latrell Reitzel had to leave the Grand Canyon yeah. game on Sunday with another head injury. If I have my, my memory correct, that's his second uh, head injury this season, man. And that's something you don't want to mess around with. So we're still waiting. Uh, last I had heard, Coach Oates said that this would be kind of game time decision with Reitzel, who has been in the starting lineup the last four games. Prior to that, it had been freshman Jaron Stevenson for five games. We've also seen Pringle in the starting lineup at times. And I think, like, at, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and assume that we probably will not see Reitzel, or at least not starting. Can I go with that? Yeah. And if so, I think you almost have to see, because I'm with you, Nelson has nothing nothing mm -hmm. for Armando Baycott. I almost think you have to try Nick Pringle because yeah. I don't know what else you're going to do. Um, you know, who, who's our big man from last year? That was the freshman from Bama. Betty Ako. Yeah. Charles Betty Ako. Like mm -hmm. he ain't there anymore. And mm -hmm. that's who Bama had for Armando Baycott in mm -hmm. the, the great four overtime matchup they had last year up in mm -hmm. Portland. So Andy, I think that I, I'm right with you there. And then we'll have to see if North Carolina can run Bama off the three-point line. That, that's a storyline to watch. And you talked about a cutting Harrison Ingram. My man had five threes on Saturday against yeah. Michigan State. So uh, we'll, what I'm always looking for with North Carolina, Andy, is this. Armando Baycott's going to get his. R.J. Davis is going to get his. Who's that third score for the Tar Heels? Yep. That's what to keep your eye on. All right, Andy, let's back up to the earlier game on Thursday night, the first game of the entire Sweet 16. Let's go Wildcats, Arizona, <laughs> and Clemson. Clemson, the second lowest seed remaining, or the second worst seed, I guess I should say, mm -hmm. remaining in the entire tournament. Does Clemson and Brad Brownell keep it rolling here against Arizona, or is this where it's just too much from Tommy Lloyd's Wildcats? I could absolutely see Clemson winning this game. Like that, that wouldn't surprise me at all. And and it's not a knock on Tommy in Arizona. They have had their their 
struggles uh, going farther in the NCAA tournament than expected. So it's probably not a super unpopular pick to have them losing earlier than anticipated. And I know everybody's eagerly anticipating the potential Caleb Love versus RJ Davis matchup if Arizona and Carolina get to meet up uh, for a chance to go to the final four. But Clemson is playing really good basketball right now. We know when this team is on, they are as good as almost anybody in the country. I think they're good enough to take down Arizona. Arizona has had plenty of inconsistencies defensively. I think P.J. Hall's a tough matchup for the Wildcats. I'll be curious if they throw uh, Kishad Johnson on him as opposed to Umar Balo, who does not defend well in space. Hall's mm-hmm. not like a super lights-out three-point shooter, but he can bring the ball away from the rim. He can do. Th- he, he's not just a peer back to the basket scorer. Balo struggles to guard guys who aren't that. And so I think there's whether, I mean, whoever you put Umar Balo on is going to be a challenge. I think Clemson, that's what gives them a bit of an advantage yeah. is they have the kind of offense that makes players like Balo they challenge them defensively. I guess that's the best way to put it. And and you you go back to the guard room. Sure, Caleb Love's going to get his. He's a phenomenal scorer. And I think that Clemson's going to have trouble defending him because most teams have trouble defending him. But sometimes Caleb Love gets in his own way. And if that happens and he's missing shots and Keelan Boswell is not necessarily stepping up and contributing, we've seen Keelan Boswell have some kind of mysterious disappearing performances throughout the season. I could absolutely see Clemson doing enough uh, with with the offensive style that they play and potentially being able to, to beat an Arizona team if those guards are not shooting as well as they normally do. That's a good word. Yeah, I, I like your point there about Caleb Love getting in his own way. I would go so far as to say getting in his own team's way yeah. at times, Andy. I mean, let, let's think back to last weekend in the round of 32 where he had a wild start. I mean, he was absolutely on fire and then just mm-hmm. nothing after that. But keep shooting because he's a shooter and I get that. And that's what Tommy Lloyd needs him to do. But his, his inefficiency at times can be a, a thorn in their side, mm-hmm. and, but they need him to score. That's the thing. Yeah. And so uh, I think the part of the Caleb love experiences, I think you coined it earlier this year is we're mm-hmm. always waiting to see which version he's going to be in any given game. And heck that can even change in game as yeah. we saw this weekend. So that's a big part of this. I wonder if Pella Larson is maybe yeah. a potential matchup problem for Clemson and and if he could be a key key part of of helping Arizona maybe get over the top I wouldn't be surprised to see Jaden Bradley play a Mm -hmm. a pivotal role in terms of like just getting out and running and making things happen I want to see if Joe Girard can get off a little bit for Clemson from three maybe he can just stretch that defense a little bit open things up a little bit for PJ Hall and Ian Shefflin the chef to go up and get a bunch of offensive rebounds Andy gonna be really interesting Thursday night what a slate of four games, Andy, we've just talked about. Well, Isaac, we had some an interesting coaching rumor that came up on Tuesday. It's not finalized by the time we're recording this right now, but could the Louisville Cardinals hire a Patino, not Rick Patino, their former coach, but his son, Richard Patino, the head coach at New Mexico. We're going to discuss that rumor and a handful of players that have entered the transfer portal, but first... This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight, folks, is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we are picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest. And just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. We're talking the only double-digit seed remaining in the Sweet 16, the Wolfpack of NC State. They are obviously this week's Nissan Rogue. The team surprised us all not only with a powerful performance in the ACC tournament to go dancing, but they've advanced all the way to the Sweet 16. They got a real chance to take down Shaka Smart and the Marquette Golden Eagles on Friday. They say win life, go rogue. And that's exactly what the Wolfpack have done here. So take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. This episode is also brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers to roof racks, exhaust kits to LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every single time or your money back. Why? Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not that precious cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want. 
It's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. We hop back on this spinning carousel that we call the coaching carousel. Andy, on uh, Monday, we had three power six moves, uh, but today we've just got an interesting rumor to talk about, which is hilarious. Mm -hmm. Because on Monday, was it Monday when we joked about that, about the idea of what if Richard Patino went to Louisville? Oh, yeah, because then I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what if his dad went back to Kentucky? That would be incredible. <laughs> now, that's not what we're talking about. But, but Andy, I'm very, like, I know we joked. But I'm legitimately intrigued by this potential of Richard Patino to Louisville. Yeah, it's, it is intriguing, and it's also hilarious. I think it's reasonable to find it funny that they're considering this. Uh, this the only funnier alternative would be if Kentucky let go of John Calipari, and Calipari then went to Louisville. That would be outrageously funny, uh, albeit quite unlikely. But Patino, I mean, he took New Mexico to the, to the NCAA tournament, to a Mountain West Conference Tournament Championship, first time since 2014 for both of those things. Uh, he's obviously had success. He had success at Minnesota, not as much success as I think there was the expectation that he would have. And I know that that's why there are some Louisville fans who are like, well, he wasn't that great at the power six level, but he led them to an NIT championship. He led them to a couple of NCAA tournament appearances. Minnesota is not a particularly easy place to coach. Uh, New Mexico is a, is a program that had not been in a very good spot. He has helped lead them to uh, a much better spot. Again, they didn't do well in the NCAA tournament once they got there, but they secured a spot. They may have stolen a spot from his dad at St. John's, which is kind of an interesting wrinkle that we saw there. And <laughs> and Louisville, I don't want to say that they're playing with house money because I think they really got to nail this coaching hire. I agree. Like they I agree. get it right, but they're not going to make a hire worse than Kenny Payne. And so that is a little bit of like relief of like Richard is not going to come to Louisville and go four and 28. I can almost guarantee you that that is not going to happen. He is too good of a coach. He has a, a name that I think will energize the fan base, energize the boosters in a way. I think he'll be able to add talent. I mean, Jamal, uh, uh, Jalen House, excuse me, and Jamal Mashburn Jr. are two incredibly talented players who he managed to recruit to New Mexico. I uh, think of what he can do with some, some of the extra money and NIL resources and just program pedigree that comes with Louisville. I think this is a, a decent hire. I, I do think it's it's humorous. And I think that there is uh, the the name is definitely carrying a little bit of weight. If he was, if it was a, the exact same resume, different coach, I'm not sure this would be super high on Louisville's list, but it's also reasonable to look at a guy who took a Mountain West program to the NCAA tournament for the first time in 10 years. I think that's a reasonable enough reason to consider a coach, uh, even if you strip away everything else. So again, here is say this is just rumor that's been yeah. speculated, but tweeted about by reputable sources. Um, and Andy, I just thought, as you said that about Jamal Mashburn Jr., who, by the way, is in the transfer portal. What if the son of a Kentucky legend winds <laughs> up at Louisville following his coach, Richard Patino? That mm -hmm. would infuriate people in Lexington. And I am here for stirring up that jelly. Andy, here's the other thing. There, there is a whole big segment of folks in Louisville, Kentucky, who thinks that the, the university should have never fired Richard's dad, Rick, that, mm -hmm. that they should have held on to him because as we saw all these other coaches just push off and push off and push off mm -hmm. uh, folks until they were able to get through their legal issues. Yeah. And, you know, a few got will waited and whatever, but mm -hmm. a lot of them kept their jobs. And so some folks are like, ah, we should never have fired him. Well, here's redemption. Bring his kid home. And let's see if that can happen. Andy, quickly, a couple portal updates to mention. Katie Johnson is going portaling, leaving Bruce Pearl and Auburn. Lynn Kidd, who is a very um, productive big at Virginia Tech, is uh, in the transfer portal as well. Malik Mack is leaving Harvard. Going to go see if he can find another smart school or maybe not as smart as school and where he can be the smartest guy on the team. Terrence Edwards Jr., who became a name that many people found out for the first time this weekend as James Madison made a little bit of a run in the first mm -hmm. round. Also, Micah Peavy from TCU. That's an interesting grab as well. All of those guys hopped into the portal on Tuesday. Yeah, uh, I'm very interested to see if Edwards will follow Coach Byington to uh, Vanderbilt. Makes That'd sense to me. Really nice fit for him. Uh, it'd be a really nice get for Vanderbilt as well. So that's definitely the name out of this group I'm keeping the closest eye on. Uh, but yeah, definitely some really talented players here who, who are going to make a big impact wherever they end up going. Just a couple other quick names to mention, and then Andy will get us out of here. These are a couple that had hopped in earlier that we just haven't mentioned yet. 
Cade Tyson is a name you don't know, but you probably know his last name. He entered on Monday out of Belmont. His older brother, Hunter, played at Clemson uh, just, you know, just in the past recent years. Yeah. This dude, Andy, 6'7", two years left. He averages 46.5% from three on five and a half attempts nice. per game. Does a lot of other stuff well, too. But I'm telling y'all, we've already seen his brother have the athleticism at this level. It will translate. He's going to have no end of suitors for his mm -hmm. great wing shooting. Kobe Johnson from USC is in the portal. Doug McDaniel from Michigan. Javon Porter, the younger brother of MPJ. And Jonte, who's in the news right now, by the way, yeah. is portaling mm -hmm. out of Pepperdine. Both those older brothers went to Mizzou. Dennis Gates did not have a great year maybe Javon winds up there yeah uh, I, I, I'm excited to see where Javon ends up that's a really intriguing one to me but Isaac that is going to wrap it up for today we did a couple, couple quick NBA draft declarations since we mentioned we were going to throw those out there Kalel Ware he's not coming back we didn't think he was coming back he's in the NBA draft AJ Store from Wisconsin he declares he does keep his eligibility curious to see what the NBA scouts have to say for him but Isaac we're going to be back on a future episode, getting you ready for the Midwest and the South regions here. And then, of course, we're going to start actually recapping these games. I'm so excited to be going live Thursday night after all these games are done. We're going to talk about them, talk about what it means for the Elite Eight. We'll get you ready for Friday's games as well. Isaac's so excited that we still got more fun basketball coming our way this weekend. Thanks to all of you who have made this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. Join us on our Discord channel if you have not done so yet. There's a link in the show notes, and it is free to join. Uh, Apologies to the lawyer family. We will talk more about that game next episode. Let's go Wildcats. They take on Clemson. And until tomorrow, peace.